the next scene that we'll talk about, which is a man and his friend, I don't think either of them are ever named in the film, possibly in the credits, are in a Winkies. This was supposed to be a Denny's, but Denny's refused to license the name, so it's a Winkies. The man, uh, one of the men, uh, the main one, describes a dream he's had twice, where he and his friend were at this particular Winkies, and they had a sense of unease, and he could see through the wall and see that there was a monster behind the back of the Winkies. So he goes out, uh, so the friend decides to tell him nothing's wrong, there's nothing out there, so they go out back to see that there's nothing there. Except then when they get there, a terrifying homeless man jumps out at them and the man who had the dream has a heart attack and dies. I can't wait for you guys to have been immediately jump scared because we edited the clip in there. Yes, and this is prob this is the most famous scene in the film. Iso isolated by itself, really? people understand it as a masterpiece of, sus uh, of suspenseful filmmaking on the same level of Al Alfred Hitchcock. And I agree, I think it's brilliant. I've seen a breakdown of this online uh, on YouTube and the the way the cinematography works is really excellent at creating a sense of unease there is no fixed camera angle that the camera is staying at throughout the entire thing it's an uneasy swaying that z seems to pull in and out of the character's face completely irrespective of whatever emotion they're trying to convey and it really keeps you on edge okay the reason it didn't for me is because I had no stakes in the survival of the characters because I didn't know who the hell they were. That's fair. I still think that the 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 very setup of the scene, the idea that there is something behind here, and he had these dreams about it, and then especially when his friend is like, okay, we'll go check. I'm going to go get up and pay, and then we can go out back. And his friend turns to see him in the exact position he saw him in the dream really does work for me as an effective way of building that tension. I don't need to know the backstory of these characters. All I need to know is that these characters are in an unusual and stressful and potentially dangerous scenario. See, I think the, the gap between our description here in many respects was like the gap between the Man of Steel description. And you might have felt the same way in that I feel like you're standing outside a house and looking at it and it's been beautifully painted and constructed <clears throat> and all this. Whereas I'm inside the house, sleeping on a concrete floor with no furnishings. And I'm like, yeah, it might it might look like it's been brilliantly constructed, but when you're trying to live in it and wanting more substance, I feel cold and alone. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I do think it does add substance uh, in terms of the tone and mm. atmosphere of the film. I also think it adds substance in knowing when you figure out what that homeless person is supposed to represent. Because the Winkies is actually set in the Denny's, which is where, supposedly in the 1950s, all of the extras used to line up to try and get a role. So it's obviously supposed to be a place where people would go to try and achieve their dreams. And on the surface level, it looks clean, it looks inviting, it looks normal. But out back, out back behind these people's dreams is a monster which will destroy them in one way or another. That's thematically clever. The reference is very clever. But then that's like, to me, that's like telling me there's a treasure chest at the bottom of the swimming pool, but you filled the swimming pool with custard. And it's like, I don't want to dive in and swim. Does that make sense? Like, it's not, it's not, it's not very inviting because the, the core substance of what I'm expecting mm. from a narrative is not there, but it is a very intricate puzzle you can enjoy unpacking. Well, that's the thing. To, to uh, continue your analogy, you may not be able to dive straight in and swim there, but I can damn well eat my way through. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a pretty good way of putting it, yeah. There, there you go. I the, feel like you're, you're, you're making me sink through it to get to the bottom. <laughs> that's, that's fair, whereas I'm just there with a spoon like, come on, yeah. man, just take your time <laughs> with Typical it. It's all right, <laughs> calm down. Hey, man. <laughs> Uh, J John Tickle gave me many a laugh as a child and brainiac science abuse running across custard. <laughs> but the next scene of the film, we are introduced to a director, Adam Kersher, hmm. uh, who is involved in a production meeting with a bunch of executives on a film that he is doing at the moment where they are telling him that he has creative control apart from one very specific element, the lead actress. Two mobster-like executives come through, one of whom is played by the film's composer, Angelo Badalamenti, oh. uh, who is the one who ends up spitting coffee onto his little napkin. They come in, are very quiet, very intimidating, they stare him down and they tell him, they give him a photo of a woman and say, this is the girl. When Adam pushes back and says, this is my film, I get to do what I want with it, they are very displeased with this. One of the mobsters, as kind of an intimidation tactic, asks for an espresso. 
He gets his espresso, which he's very, very particular about, and instead of drinking it, he takes a sip, decides he doesn't like it, and just spits it out. Uh, and then one of the uh, and then the other executive gets up and screams coffee. <laughs> which is, I always find quite amusing when Adam refuses, then Adam, uh, deciding that he's had enough of this, being pushed around, leaves, takes his golf club, which he just has with him for some reason, and uh, goes and smashes up their limousine. And then we get an extra scene immediately after that of a very shady, seemingly underground room, which contains a midget, played by a man called Michael J. Anderson, who shows up in David Lynch's other work, Twin Peaks, uh, where they tell him he's not going to go ahead with the girl, and the midget tells him, you need to do what's, uh, what needs to be done then. I was lost throughout all of this, I'm going to be honest. Again, there's, you can get the atmosphere of the stereotypical mobsters. It's almost like in Batman The Long Halloween, where they literally rip Carmine Falcone out of Marlon Brando's performance in The oh, Godfather. Yeah. So it's very prototypical, and I, the, I understand the dreamlike quality of the film trying to set up a conspiracy means that they can get away with being stereotypical, because that's what your unconscious is going to pull from. It's going to pull from almost movie stereotypes, right? But then... When it gets to the point of, and this is the part that really enraged me, when it gets to the point of him showing back up at his home, and Billy Ray Cyrus is not playing himself as a cameo joke, he's playing an actual character, mm -hmm. I was like, why is Harry showing me this film? Because I, I can't take it seriously. I, I think it's very amusing. I think that's supposed to be a funny scene where Billy Ray Cyrus shows up and cooks Adam, <laughs> Adam Kasher with his own wife. Uh, but obviously the... Hollywood executives being portrayed as mobsters is something that runs throughout the entirety of the film. Mm. It's supposed to be presenting the idea that Hollywood is not this land of dreams. It's in fact a land uh, that is run by people who do not have your best interest in mind. They don't really care about the creative process or presenting any kind of artistic, uh, any anything of artistic merit. They only care about their very strange wants and whims. And it, I think it is implied as well well, it's not necessarily implied, but you can pick up the idea that the only reason that they desperately want this woman in the film is because of the fact that she's probably slept with at least one of yep. them, or possibly all of them. Uh, yes, later on in the film, Adam shows up at his flat, uh, well, at his big fancy Hollywood Hills home, and finds that a man called Gene, a cleaner, almost like some kind of porn scenario from the 1970s, uh, has arrived and cooked him, uh, as, as he finds him in bed with his wife, his wife immediately starts blaming him for this and telling him it's all your fault <laughs> for <Typical>. neglecting me. <laughs> and then when he <laughs> when he realizes this, he grabs the jewelry that he bought for her, goes into the kitchen, grabs a bucket of paint, and pours paint all over her jewelry. To which Jean punches her uh, punches him in the face, and he gets kicked out of his own home. Adam is not having a very good day. He's not having a very good day at all because later on he's driving, uh, trying to find a hotel, some place to stay, and gets a call from his assistant who tells him that now the entire production of the film that he was working on has been pulled. They've just completely pulled the plug. So his life is steadily being ruined one moment at a time. Then we see later on that some mobs enforcer types have tried to go to his house to track him down. Gene tries to beat them up as well, but is slightly less successful in doing so. And they also, thank goodness, give his wife a punch in the face as well. <laughs> Based. <laughs> uh, because she is very, very, very shrill. And uh, then Adam later on, this is, this is all presented, uh, I'm, I'm talking about this as if it's all one after the other, but this is presented out of sequence. It might in fact be good to just sort of talk about these, mm. each character's journey, how they can interact, and then go from, uh, go from there. Adam himself uh, then ends up at a sleazy hotel later, yep. at which point the, bar, uh, the hotel manager tells him that, his entire, uh, that a man from the bank showed up and cut his entire line of credit told him all of his cards will no longer work. All Adam has on him is a bit of cash so he can pay the guy. But the man says to him, listen, they know where you are, whoever these people are who are looking for you. So you might want to clear off. So Adam calls his uh, assistant again, who tells him that she has been given an offer for him, which is to go to a corral in, uh, up, up in the Hollywood Hills and meet with a man called the Cowboy, who has an offer. Doesn't she try to flirt with him down the phone? She also tries to get him to crash at her place, and when he says no, she says, well, you don't know what you're missing. But once again, I'm sure there are plenty of real-life stories in Hollywood of assistants also trying to sleep their yeah. way into beneficial positions for themselves. That's actually quite interesting in, in where you said earlier 
about the mobsters being very insistent on this being the girl you must pick because she's probably slept with one or multiple of them. I'm going to puzzle through this because it might sound controversial, right. but obviously the, the Harvey Weinstein types are disgusting rapists. However, that framing makes it seem like it's also in like a mutually beneficial interest it's system. Yeah, there's there's like a system of perverse incentives here for almost these creepy mobster-like guys who sleep with these women to hold their dreams over them to keep their word. Otherwise, they are... Um, incentive will just well, otherwise, evaporate. Otherwise, why would the women sleep with you in the first place? Exactly. So there's this almost it's perverse a, mutual dependency. Yeah, it's a perverse honour code. Yeah, You could is. describe it as. And I think that is very intentional because the film, while drawing attention to the fact that this does go on, is not forgiving or necessarily just wank, uh, wiping the, blank, uh, a, the slate clean for these women. Mm. It is also saying you had some agency in this. Yeah. You did this because you wanted to be successful. You did this because you wanted to become a famous star. You could have stopped at any point, and there are parts of the film later on which do also tie into this. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.